Oh, good evening. Thank you, Katie, for the nice intro. Uh, for you listeners, uh, th thank you for foregoing the football games. And I'm looking forward to leaving in an hour and seeing what the scores are myself. So uh, thank you for your patience. You may have read in my brief biography that I worked for Ford Corporate and bought my first clock at Schmidt's Antiques in Ypsilanti, Michigan. A couple of years later, Ford transferred me to Los Angeles, and after a while, I met Jim Sipper in Long Beach. Now, Jim likes all kinds of interesting clocks, but at the time, he concentrated on skeleton clocks. And more than anyone else, Jim helped to inspire my skeleton clock collecting. To start with, there are several basic frame styles. The first is the inverted Y with a winding arbor located at the junction of the Y and the smaller wheels ascending up the trunk. The simplicity of the Y frame shows off the well-made wheels and the escapement usually placed at the top of the frame. Next is the rafter style with several vertical pieces often crossed with bars of brass carrying the clock train. Early Gothic style skeletons were usually rafter style. Next is the scroll frame style, which was made in many, many variations, but is predominated by swirls, whirls, and curved bits of brass. And our primary concentration today, after a brief intro, will be on architectural frame styles, or frames designed to appear as the front view of major monuments or cathedrals. But first, let's go back a bit and do some review. Oh my goodness, there we go. Um, here we have uh, what an early French skeleton clock, inverted Y circa 1790. We've seen this style clock as early as 1738. Jim and I had one signed by a month. Um, you see the spring barrel is attached to the base and then the frame itself is attached separately to the base and the power travels up from the spring barrel to the fusee. A couple of notes, the frames are held to the pillars by these cast brass rosettes and the rosettes cast with a little tail on it which in turn is threaded with a die so that it holds, you know, threads into the pillar and holds the frame to the pillar. Um, this is a pinwheel. Most of these French skeleton clocks are pinwheels and you can see the arms of the verge down the side. And the bases are often adorned with friezes or castings or other gilt ornamentation. Now, early English skeleton timepieces followed the French influence. A lot of people would look at this and say, oh, another French skeleton clock, but it's really English. This one's by Whitehurst of Derby. This was sold by Bonhams in 2009. There's some little differences. You'll notice that the, um, the, the spring barrel is spoked, as in the French example, but the, the, the spokes are a little more robust. Um, instead of rosettes to hold the frame to the pillars, you've got blued screws and uh, the dial instead of porcelain, this one happens to be gilt brass engraved, the dial. And then, of course, up here in the escapement area, uh, instead of a pinwheel, you've got a Graham-style deadbeat escapement and a Graham-style anchor here and you can see the, a suspension spring and the pendulum hanging down the back. The French example, of course, had a silk thread suspension. Now this is another early English example, around 1835. Also a great wheel. This is a, a going barrel example. I've seen these with retailers' names all the way from Brighton to Belfast, but in my experience, this uh, sort of modified Y-frame uh, originated in Liverpool. Uh, this one is a passing bell at the hour and typical of most of the early skeleton clocks it has a solid dial and the time is much easier to read than on some of the later skeleton clocks. 
Now, there was one unique fellow, John Pace of Bury St. Edmunds. He chose a still different layout for his clocks. He tended to put the uh, the dials in a large, heavy portion at the bottom. He always had a high-relief dial. And in this case, he has a long-running clock, so he just stacked the um, gears straight up, almost like the Y train. Uh, th this one is either a six months or a year clock. Again, he used a heavy cast brass base, and he always engraved his name, John Pace, Bury St. Edmunds, there in the base. And you can see other examples like this in the skeleton clock books. In the 1830s, James Conliffe of Liverpool produced his phase one clock design. Note that he kept the spring barrels attached to the base plate of the clock. And the plates are held aloft by these four pillars. It may only look like there's two, but there's actually four if you look carefully. Followed by a pair of plates. The fusees are here. And the escapement is up at the apex. One of the nice features of most of these uh, Conliffe skeleton clocks is that they have a center seconds hand, and they have a seconds beating balance. So you get true seconds showing on the dial, you get the sound of the escapement, and it all goes together in an attractive package. By the 1840s, Conliffe had refined his design, surrounding the balance wheel with delicate framing that you see here. Sometimes he used a serpent instead of the framing. Note he liked the spoke spring barrels, and you can see the daylight showing through the spring. Um, I, you can see right here uh, James Conliffe Liverpool engraved into the nameplate there on the base. Now I didn't, um, well, let me go ahead to the escapement first before I cover that. A close-up of the escapement shows the long balance staff. It's about two and three quarter inches long. You can see the helical hairspring and the seconds beating balance right here. Again, this clock with a center seconds hand. Now I did not uh, show an example of his phase three clocks, which uh, tended to be just the two plates, typical of the other manufacturers. They're still very elaborate. They still have the fancy escapement, but it's the phase one and the phase two that tend to attract the most attention. By the mid-1800s, still only a few specialized makers produced skeleton clocks in limited numbers, and they were expensive, but that was about to change. Uh, just briefly, this is a clock by John Bennett. Now, I bought this from Keith Bannum in 1981. Actually, Jim tipped it over to me. He was in the midst of another big deal, and, and he didn't feel he could handle it at the time, so he called me up and he says, call Keith right now. So I called Keith and made arrangements to buy the clock. And I had the clock until uh, 2005 uh, when it was sold at Christie's in New York in June of 2005. Now the interesting thing, you can tell it's a scroll frame. You can see all the swirls and whirls that I was talking about. But the interesting thing about these frames is that they start out at the base about an inch and a quarter thick. They're in relief and they're three-dimensional. Dimensional, and this is a—you know, can see in these curved pieces, it's 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 very wide on the outside and it's very narrow on the inside, and so the plates vary with all this three-dimensional design, and they end up toward the top where they're perhaps only three-eighths inch a inch thick. <laughs> you see a typical dial in relief with. Um, porcelain cartouche numerals, and you can see all the fine detail on the skeletonized work. Okay, let's move forward to this, from this, and talk a bit about Evans. William Frederick Evans was born in 1818, and by 1840 he was active in Hansworth as a clockmaker. He exhibited the first of his architectural models, the Sir Walter Scott Memorial, at the Great Exhibition of 1851. Now, the memorial was just finished in 1844, so you know, it was a relatively short time that he had to sort of decide to do this and come up with some wooden models and decide that he was going to put a clock in it. 
Later, Smith and Sons of Clerkenwell would follow Evans' lead and introduce architectural models of their own. However, Smith never produced a frame depicting the Scott Memorial, which was Evans' first design. Both companies helped to spread the popularity of skeleton clocks. All right, the books in the internet give complete biographies of Scott. However, in one sentence, we could say that he was a judge, a novelist, and a poet. Here's one view of the memorial, and I'll click and show you a second one. Whether you have visited Edinburgh, Scotland, or simply have read about Scott, you have certainly seen photographs of the tall, four-buttress memorial built in his honor. The memorial, as you see it here, was begun in 1841 and was dedicated in 1844. Now, Scott was born in 1771 and died in 1832. Although world famous for his literary work, at home he was a judge and legal administrator. In London, he was best known for unearthing the crown jewels that had been squirreled away after the coronation of Charles II and found by Scott in Edinburgh Castle in 1819. For this unselfish gesture, he was made a baronet in 1820 and was thereafter known as Sir Walter Scott. Now, you can see here in both this and the previous, you can see this white stone statue of Sir Walter Scott and his trusty dog. And here's an example of a timepiece. Um, you can see Sir Walter and his dog showing in the open area of the memorial, just as in the real memorial. Now this one is a timepiece. You can see it's got a vertical lever on the front plate right here. Here's the large balance wheel. He used a large balance wheel, just a little over an inch in diameter. He used a robust cast dial. Later when we get to some Smith clocks, they tended to use thin material for their dials. They cut them out, fretted them out with a jeweler's saw. But Evans typically cast his dials and then finished them off and engraved them uh, with the numerals. Now, also he made strikers. Here's an example of a double fusee striker. And you get a little different angle view of Sir Walter and his dog. And I've had a couple of these. In addition, in addition, there's a little bowler hat, uh, also gilt bronze uh, that he would have worn for, if, well, he was serving as a judge or for formal occasions, I guess. Again, you see the dial is still very similar on the two train. You can see the canted buttresses here on the corners, much like the actual monument. You see the two spring barrels. The two winding arbors and fusees are up here. You can see the chain wrapped around the fusee here. You can see the governor fly on the back. Okay, let's move on to York, England. York Minster is the largest Gothic cathedral in Northern Europe. The first recorded church was built on this site in York in 627 and the current structure was begun in the year 1220. The cathedral was looted and fell into disrepair during the English Reformation. And this is true of almost all the cathedrals in England. During the Civil War and the Reformation, they were all looted and several of them were destroyed by fire. Restorations in 1730 and 1820 helped to preserve the cathedral. Now this is a night view uh, where's my, there's my pointer. This is a spotlight actually showing on the front of the cathedral and sort of, it's probably a summer evening in England. Uh, but notice the spires up here at the top because those spires will be repeated uh, on the clock. Notice the windows here in the towers. Notice the vertical pieces because you're going to see those repeated even in the clock itself. Here we go. This is a, a daytime shot uh, at the turn of the century of York Minster Cathedral. Again, you can see the spires. You can see tourists walking on the street, and you can see the modern cars here. 
And here at last are Evans' interpretation of York Minster Cathedral in his clock. Uh, like the cathedral, you see lots of vertical lines. Here's those windows that I showed you in the towers. And then at the top, of course, you can see the spires. Again, you see a heavy cast and relieved dial with uh, engraved and black wax filled Roman numerals. You, see, you can see the gong, the hour gong, peeking through the frame here. And of course, the bell was struck just on the half hour, so you had a half hour bell and full gong count on the hour. And to the right, we've got a, a an eight bell Whittington chime, three train Evans. Again, you see the same style of heavy relief dial, uh, the same basic frame. Uh, he engineered the frame so that they would accommodate either the two or the three train. Here's a couple more Evans. This particular one on the left is a presentation piece, still with its silvered brass presentation. Uh, in the time period, probably 1855 to 1870, skeleton clocks uh, became wonderful as presentation pieces for like retiring mayors or retiring provincial governors or someone who maybe worked for a prominent company for 30 or 40 years. The workers would get together and they'd buy them a nice uh, two-train Evan striking clock. I probably had more Evans with presentation plaques on them than, than any other clock. Now on the right side, you'll notice here on the left side is the more common frame with this straight frets to the side. Now on this frame on the right, he has carefully severed this fret here, just where I'm drawing the line. And then he's angled it to a 45 degree angle and he's drilled and tapped a couple of holes and he's put these four buttresses on at an angle, similar to what you see in the Sir Walter Scott Memorial. This doesn't occur very often. Maybe only, I'd say, maybe one in 25 have I ever seen with this buttressing. But it's a nice feature. Okay, we'll move on to London and Westminster Abbey. Benedictine monks first established a worship, worship site here around the year 950. The Abbey has been the coronation church in England since 1066, since the Norman invasion. The current church, begun by Henry III in 1245, is perhaps the most important Gothic building in England, certainly the best known by London tourists. And clock folks enjoy the fact that Thomas Tompion was buried there in 1715, followed by his friend George Graham in 1751. These two men helped to improve the accuracy and timekeeping, and the groundwork they laid led England to reign supreme in the clockmaking industry for nearly two centuries. Although there may be exceptions that I'm not aware of, virtually all of the Westminster Abbey frame clocks were produced by W.F. Evans in Handsworth. Now here are a couple of photographs. Now if you've been to London, you could have probably taken either one of these. The one on the left on a normal overcast day and the one on the right probably on a nice sunny summer day and uh, the cathedral looks like all clean and white. And uh, the typical tourist will stand here and have his travel partner take a picture of him with the cathedral in the background. And here is Evans' interpretation of the cathedral in clock form. Now, there's a couple of things that I can talk about in this slide. Now, I've been collecting skeleton clocks since about 1972. And I've had a lot of Westminster Abbeys. But this, in all that time, and at roughly 43 years, I have only had one, only one timepiece with Bell at the Hour, Westminster Abbey skeleton clock. And here you see it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's an odd thing. I, I guess most people thought if they were going to spend the money on a large cathedral clock, they'd just soon have a striker or a chimer. But here somebody wanted a timepiece and they put it together for them. Now there's another thing here that 
uh, is sort of unique to Evans. Uh, uh, approximately a third, between 30 and 35 percent of his skeleton clocks have a porcelain dial. And that's okay. That's legitimate. It was an option in his catalog. You could get the porcelain dial if you were having trouble seeing the time, or you could get your choice of a couple of fretted dials. Now, on this frame style on the Westminster Abbey, the most common dial is this solid chapter green ring with engraved, little fancy engraving in between the numerals, and it's attached to this third plate which stands out in front of the normal frame. Again, you can see the gong, you can see the two spring barrels, you can see the gong just peeking through the frame and the bell is struck on the half hour. Here's a couple more Westminster Abbeys. This one again with the more common dial. Now, when these are complete, they have really what we would say four plates. You've got your two clock plates here, you've got a third plate which carries the dial, and then out in front, perhaps you can see it more clearly on the right, out in the front you've really got a fourth plate which sticks out about a half an inch from the third plate acting or tending to depict the entrance into the abbey. Now these are both Triple Fuse Z Whittington Chime 8 bells. Again this one with the normal solid dial and again this is showing the option this fretted dial most commonly occurred on the Sir Walter Scott Memorial, but it was he had them made. If you wanted it on the Westminster Abbey, he would certainly put it on for you. Okay, let's travel south now from London to Brighton. Uh, the Royal Brighton Pavilion. Uh, no trip to England is complete without a trip to Brighton and to see with one owns eyes the most famous and opulent royal extravaganza in existence. Now the museum at the pavilion is worth a visit. Brighton Pavilion was built in three stages beginning in 1787 as a seaside retreat for George, Prince of Wales, who became the Prince Regent in 1811. It is built in the Indo-Saracenic style prevalent in India for most of the 19th century. The current appearance of the pavilion with its dome and minarets is the work of architect John Nash who extended the building starting in 1815. And here you see the building as you would see it today. Now, uh, if I can get my, where's, where's my mouse? There it is. It goes to sleep. This large onion-shaped portion in the center, or the shape of the smaller ones, whichever you choose to pick, is what we're going to find that John Smith and Sons chose to make the predominant feature of the clock showing here. The Bright Brighton Pavilion was made by Smith and Sons Clerkenwell, 1875 to 80. It was a catalog item. The large dial is finely pierced with a band of little vines and buds around the outer circumference in lieu of a chapter ring. And the dial is flanked by ormolu lions right and left. And at the apex we have a cast eagle. Now these are the same lions and the same eagle that are also seen on a timepiece that Smith showed in their catalog called the Eagles and Lions timepiece. It's also a nice collectible clock. Okay, we're going to move on with a rear view of the clock here. This one uh, is from an um, auction about 10 years ago in England. You can see it's labeled with lot number 556. Now, uh, note the gong base and the pendulum are standard Smith issue. If you're buying a Smith skeleton clock, you should see this fancy club-shaped standard at the top of the riser holding the gong. And you should see this style disc pendulum with a little steel trim rosette front and back. And there should be three bars coming out of the top of the pendulum. Uh, usually two steel and one brass, and it's that center bar which rises up to this point 
just below the suspension spring and there's a thumb screw which you can barely see right in there which is used for your rating fast and slow on all Smith skeleton clocks are going to have that skeleton if it doesn't oh it's not the end of the world you'll still survive but if it doesn't look around maybe you'll find a Smith's on eBay that you can buy and update your own clock all right let's move back north again north of Birmingham to Litchfield, Litchfield Cathedral. The city lies just 17 miles north of Birmingham and this site has been a place of worship and study since the year 669. The Gothic Cathedral was begun in 1195 and is recalled visually by its three tall spires. The church was severely damaged during the Reformation and Civil War. That's a standard issue on these big places. And its current splendor was restored by the architect Sir George Scott in the third quarter of the 1800s. Now this photo is taken from a good distance, probably with, with perhaps a telephoto lens or the photos cropped. But you see that in reality, uh, the central spire is really much larger than the two side spires. Uh, we're going to move forward here. Here's another shot, and you're going to see now we're down lower, and we're closer to the cathedral, and all the spires look nearly the same size. But in reality, the central one is nearly twice as large as the ones in the front. Now, looking at this uh, photo, you can see the sort of little gingerbread work here on the front of the cathedral. And when we get to the next plate and look at the clock, I'll show you some differences. In addition to John Smith, several small companies cast plates for and manufactured a Litchfield Cathedral clock. All are two trained strikers, some with a quarter bell and sometimes a half hour bell. Now the Smith's version is the most elaborate and all, whoops, well, I, got, I forgot I inserted this. This is a page from Smith's catalog of 1865 showing a line drawing of Litchfield Cathedral skeleton clock. Note the trim at the tops of the spires and that the central spire is larger than the side ones. Um, this drawing is repeated in Royal Collard's book on skeleton clocks, so you can always find it in there. Now here on the left is an actual Smith. Now remember when I was showing you the photograph of the little you know fretwork on the front of the cathedral. Here you see it repeated on the Smith's clock. Now this is another, I don't know whether it's an Evans or one of the other makers, but the others tended to be simpler and they didn't have that extra fretwork. Uh, the spires are not as large on the other makers as on the the Smiths. They tended to have this nice groove up the side and with prominent holes in them like the originals. Um, now this one would have had balls and some flags on too like the Smiths, but the Smiths is still intact. It's got its little trim balls and its little weather vane or flags or whatever you want to call. Typical of a Smiths clock, it's got a thin highly fretted dial, it's got nice wheel work and nice delicate cocks and work on the front plate. All right, let's move back to London again to St. James Palace. This was built originally for Henry VIII and this building still serves as a business center for the royal family and assistants. It is one of London's oldest palaces it's situated on Marlborough Road in Pall Mall, just north of St. James Park. If you do any walking around in downtown London, you're bound to go by this palace and snap a photo of the ever-present guard out front. It also has a nice tower clock in the center there. You can see the parapets up at the top of the two sides, and when we get to the next slide, you're going to see an artist, Sir Evans, rendition of those parapets. You can see he chose to make a lovely uh, ormolu casting of Queen Victoria nicely chased in a gown and he inserted that 
uh, in the entryway of the palace. Again, uh, these are Evans clocks, and uh, in this particular model, I have only ever seen porcelain dials. That doesn't mean that one of you don't have one with a fretted dial. You may well have it, but the ones that I've seen and photographed have had the typical Evans porcelain dial. Again, we have a gong at the hour and a bell at the half hour on both of these examples. All right, now we're going to travel south a bit again to Oxford. Tom Tower, Christ Church in Oxford. Now this tower is named for the large bell it houses, the bell known simply as Great Tom. The tower and bell are over Tom Gate, which leads to Tom Quad. I'm sure if you're an Oxford alumnus, <laughs> those are familiar things to you. This square tower with oct octagonal lantern and faceted OG dome was designed by Sir Christopher Wren and built in the years 1681 to 82. Smith and Sons made the likeness skeleton clock as a two train and there are relatively few around. Our first image retains its original base. I'm away from that. We'll get there. Our first image retains the original base and presentation plaque. The second one has had its top flag replaced with a small finial, and the third is on a rectangular base with a glazed cover. I'll get to those. Here's a couple more photographic views of Tom Tower, and here a line drawing from probably 1850 or so of Tom Tower over Tom Gate. And here, uh, a friend in Florida was kind enough to send me this photograph of his Tom Tower two-train skeleton clock. And here, again, you see a typical fretted Smith's dial. You see the tower very well recreated up here at the top. You can see the gong here. You can see the proper Smith's pendulum. And you can see the hammer for the half-hour bell. Here's two more examples. Again, um, they may have all started out originally on marble bases with domes, but you know, let's face it, domes get broken. If you're a skeleton clock collector, you know that. Again, you can see the gong showing through the plates, the half-hour bell and hammer, the large fretted dial, the two fusees, and the typical Smith's this pendulum, and as I've said before, there's no rating nut at the bottom on a Smith's pendulum because the rating takes plus place up at the top of the pendulum. Now, it's likely this little ball finial is a replacement. What you would expect to see is a little weather vane structure like this. Now, this particular clock lost its dome, and a good workman attached it to a brass plate attached the brass plate to, I don't know, a piece of mahogany or something, and it had a, you know, a five-pane glaze cover made for it, which is taken off for the photo. All right, now we're back to London again. St. Paul's is the largest cathedral in London, although there have been churches on this site since the year 604. Most were destroyed by fire. In 1087, the old St. Paul's was begun and completed around the year 1290. I'm showing a drawing here depicting the original Norman layout. Now, this church burned in the Great London Fire of 1666. But before we go to the next slide, let's talk about the Norman church here. Uh, they put the transept a cross piece of the cross nearer the center of the church. It has flying buttresses here in the French style. They put the bell tower in the center of the transept and they put the spire on the top of the single tower. So again, that's a typical Norman design and that's going to compare, which we'll see eventually with the uh, Sir Christopher Wren's design. After the fire in 1666, the Archbishop of Canterbury, on agreement with the Council of Bishops, 
charge Sir Christopher Wren with a job of creating a cathedral, quote, handsome and noble to all the ends of it and to the reputation of the city and the nation, unquote. Work began in 1675. The final product is a grand and imposing structure with prominent dome. The dome figures significantly in Smith's design of St. Paul's skeleton clock, as we'll see. To my knowledge, all clocks in this frame are triple fusee chimers. All right, first this is a, a watercolor from across the Thames, probably uh, 1850, mid-19th century, showing uh, St. Paul's Cathedral in the distance, uh, showing the Thames and commercial buildings along the Thames, other church spires showing. Here's a black and white uh, tintype from around 1865, showing the front entrance of St. Paul's, again the prominent dome. Uh, this is a modern photograph. Up, I didn't know my wheel would do that. This is a modern photograph around 18, 1998 from the southeast side. You can see the clock tower here on the left side. Well, we'll try the roller. Okay, now this is a modern photograph. You can see it's from the air and, and with all of these high-rise buildings built up around the cathedral. I know that was my, one of my frustrations when I first visited London in 1973 was I wanted to see St. Paul's and uh, well I was really practically on top of it before I realized I was there because the building all around it makes it difficult to identify. Anyway, you, here you see it in all its grandeur. And this brings us to the clock. This photo courtesy of Christie's in London. Uh, we've got a bell Whittington Chimer. And uh, here are the two towers, which you saw. Can I go back easy enough? There's the two towers. We're viewing it from this. And the prominent dome, and the dome is pierced. And when it plays, the pin, the pin drum rotates, uh, is laying there right to left, and rotates front to back and the hammers are raised, and the hammers actually enter into the little piercings here in the dome of the clock. The dial is about 12 and a half inches in diameter. I'll go to the next slide for some more detail. Here you can see the detail on the dial. Outside of each shield is a royal crown showing, 12 of those. You can see the skeletonized hour snail clearly here on the left. You can see the nicely fretted cock here on the right. All the frets are nicely done. You can see the nice skeletonizing and fretting on the tail of the rack. And here this clock has a trigger mechanism for actuating the quarter strike. This would have been pulled down and released very similar to that on a Vienna regulator. And that also is nicely fretted. Now that's going to bring us to the end of our work on architectural clocks and bring me to a bit of a research project that I had. Around 1997, a dealer in Maine showed me an Evans striking skeleton clock that he had bought out of a home. Now, neither he nor I had seen this model before. Since that time, I've found several and some variants and some missing the odd bits. Most utilize Evans platform lever, a robust and reliable escapement. Again, I showed you that on the first Sir Walter Scott Memorial. All are strikers. In my research, there were to this point, none of, none of this model pictured in Iyer Royer College book on skeleton, nor in Derek Roberts' book titled British Skeletons. Now, a couple years later, in 98, a clock came up for auction in Yorkshire, England, that had one feature of this unusual clock, and that was a lower freeze down here of a scantily clad couple relaxing at the shore. Well, at this point, I had seen two clocks with this unusual artwork, the one in Maine and this one in England, but I didn't have either. Note the dial on this one not quite as fancy as the other, is a typical Evans casting. The collets here for the, to hold the frames to the pillars are typical deep dish Evans design. Okay. 
Then around 2003, I found another of the Yorkshire style. Now, again, this is the same frame as this one. I didn't buy this one, but I managed to buy this one. But it was still not the exact clock I had seen in Maine with three plates. However, this is a feature of both the models, and that is the bottom three inches of the clock are just simple cast bars across. They're not fancily designed or fretted in any way like you would expect in a normal skeleton clock. And the reason they're not fancy is because they're not meant to be seen. They're going to be covered up by this freeze. All right. Oops, here we go. Now, around 2009, a variant of the three plate cropped up with the freeze, with this butterfly girl at the top, but not with the expected dial and not the dial surround of the special main clock. I bought it anyway and continued looking for the elusive clock. I was getting closer and here it came. Finally in the summer of 2012, Rick Merritt phoned me to say there was an unusual two train coming up at Pook and Pook. Here finally was a clock like the main one with the racy freeze at the bottom and the dozen maidens surrounding the dial. Now, we figure this was an effort by Evans and Son, perhaps as late as 1885, to add a French flavor to the skeleton line in an effort to broaden its appeal. Well, I didn't have any luck. I wasn't successful in buying this clock. Okay, but around three months later, an almost identical clock, this one with a horizontal platform here, not a vertical like the previous, came up in Freeman's, Philadelphia. And that clock was in nice shape with original dome, and we were successful with our bidding. The photos are shown here. Now, I welcome emails from anyone else who has either of these models discussed here with the romantic couple shown at the base. Because if I can get enough pictures of different ones, I'd uh, make a little supplement or something to put out. All right, now um, I'm just about near the end of things here. Uh, there are many other variants of skeleton clocks, especially those with unusual escapements. If an engineer could think of it, it doesn't matter whether it's a gravity escapement, a detent, bend the pendulum detent escapement, or a chronometer detent escapement. If he could think of it, somebody wanted to make a skeleton clock with it. And you'll find all of those escapements on skeleton clocks, and you'll find many of them pictured in the books. Now, I want to talk about books. Now, Derek Roberts' book is out of print, titled British Skeleton Clocks, and so I quickly looked, just an hour ago, I looked on a Libris and eBay books, and I was absolutely stunned to see that they're selling for between uh, $300 and $550. So unless you're really an advanced collector and really want Derek's book, I suggest you consider Royer Collard's book, which was published around 1968 or 9. And Royer Collard's book really is a good overview, and it has a lot of the information that uh, Derek's has. It doesn't have quite as many pictures, but it's really a very good reference book. And I find several of those books for sale on Elibris and eBay books in the range sort of thirty to fifty dollars. So if you don't have one of those books, why don't you try to pick up Royer Collard's books? Okay, well I've come to the end of my presentation and now if you have sent your questions to Katie, she's going to read the questions to me and I'll do my best to answer them. Over to you. Hello? Hello. Okay. I guess you didn't hear me. I was still muted. Um, yes. The question from Dale is, I notice Winnington chimes are primarily used. Why is that? 
it was just the most popular tune of the day uh, starting I, I forget exactly you can look up Whittington tune uh, on the internet but let's say it was composed uh, 1840 or 1850 1850 it quickly became the most desirable eight bell uh, sequence for chiming clocks and on those uh, clocks made with eight bells, whether they were bracket clocks or skeleton clocks, they played the Whittington tune. It was a matter of popularity. It was what people wanted to hear. They either wanted to hear Westminster Chime or Whittington. Okay. And if anyone else has any questions, um, we'll give you a couple minutes to type those in. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that we will have another webinar again next month, and that date is February 21st, and that will be given by Bob Frischman, and he will be talking about art in horology. If you have read any of his um, bulletin articles on that series, um, it'll be a nice uh, talk to go along with that series. So we'll just give everyone a few more minutes to type in any additional questions. And here's another one that... Uh, just came up uh, from Greg. If someone was interested in purchasing an English skeleton clock, is there a price range and type and maker that would be a good starter type to look for? Oh, but the answer to that is going to be long and deep. Um, you, you can find skeleton clocks for sale on the internet um, ranging in price from let, let, let's pick a lower level, like let's say $750 for a nice single train up to maybe 3500 to 4000 for a nice two train and, and, and that's probably the range. Now these, um, there's, a, there's a gothic style uh, timepiece skeleton with sort of two swirls at the bottom and, and three spires at the top. Um, this typical gothic thing with these two rounded swirls at the bottom, they were made from kits around 1900. Skeleton clocks were always pricey and clock makers found that they could buy these kits for 35 pounds. They could take a, an abandoned pub clock which had a fusee movement in it and they could, uh, with a depthing tool, lay out the train and drill the frame for the pub clock movement and voila, they had an instant skeleton clock. But there's a big difference between a kit skeleton clock made 1900 to 1910 and a genuine skeleton clock made in the period, oh, let's say 1830 to 1890 in that period. Um, so the, 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 the sky is the limit. It, 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 that's three years ago, at um, there, there was a big skeleton clock auction at Christie's in London. And they sold some uh, two train skeleton clocks in the 3,000 pound category. And they had one four train skeleton clock that sold in the 100,000 pound category. So there really is a very wide divergence in price and quality. But still, in the, at the beginning level, you should be able to spend $750 to 1,000 for a real nice one train. You should be able to spend three to four thousand dollars for a nice two train. If you do your research and if the seller is honest, th those are pretty good ranges for find, finding something in America today. Okay, and our next question from Lee, are there any with St. Michael's chimes? Well, I've never seen one, no. I've never seen a skeleton. That doesn't mean it, it does not exist, it just means I haven't seen it. Okay, and I think that's all the questions we had. Um, so thank you again, Bob, and thank you everyone for uh, tuning in this evening, and we will uh, have this recording available if you want to review it again um, at your leisure. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.